you dream of making a good living from your art, you need to reach a point where you're not only selling, but selling for fairly high prices. In this video, I'm gonna explain the three keys that you need to understand if you want your work to be selling in the thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars instead of hundreds of dollars. If you don't know me, I'm Tim Packer. 25 years ago, I quit my job as a police officer to pursue my dream of becoming a successful full-time artist. For the first few years, I struggled and made less than $20,000 a year. But fast forward to now, I've made several million dollars from the sale of my work and consistently earn over $200,000 a year. How was I able to do that? It wasn't by increasing the number of paintings I did every year, but it was by being able to command higher prices for the work that I did. When I first started out, I was selling my paintings in the $100 to $500 range. So it's not surprising for the first few years I made less than $20,000. It's simply a math problem. With an average price of $250, I'd have to sell 80 paintings a year to do 20,000 in sales. And that's gross earnings. By the time you account for the material costs, for studio space, for gallery commissions, all of the expenses that go into being an artist, you'd be lucky to make actually $10,000 profit per year on those kind of sales. And that's why it's no surprise that a recent survey of self-described full-time artists found that 80% of them have less than $10,000 in gross sales per year, and half of those artists have less than $5,000 per year. Now with the poverty line at the US at $15,000 per year for a single person, it's clear that the starving artist stereotype is alive and well. But it doesn't have to be that way. If you're willing to do the work and do the right things at the right time, you too could be living your dream life as an artist and earning six figures and multiple six figures from the sale of your art. But I can tell you this, it won't happen overnight and it's gonna require a significant amount of effort and work on your part. But if you have a passion for art, you have a solid work ethic and a willingness and ability to learn, I can tell you that it's not only possible, but highly probable that you too could become a successful artist if you put in the work. How can I say this with such certainty? Well, not only do I have my own story to support this, but I now have a number of students who've gone on to great success within a year or two of joining my academy and following my process. So if you're serious about doing what you love and being able to make a great living from that, you can click on the link in the description to learn more about my Unstoppable Artist program. So let's get back to the high prices. If you want to get high prices for your work, you need to understand the three factors that determine the perceived value of a piece of art. Now, by perceived value, I mean how much in general the public values your work and would be willing to pay for it. So those three factors are desirability, scarcity, and urgency. The higher you can score in all three of these attributes, the more money people will be willing to pay for your paintings and the faster your work will sell. Now, I have a story I like to tell that demonstrates that. This is back about 20 years ago when I was attending a workshop with Zoltan Zabo, who was one of the gods of watercolor at that time. Every day, Zoltan would complete a painting in about an hour and a half. Uh, and these were full sheet watercolors that were demonstration paintings. And they would be available for sale after the class. And they would sell for $500 US, which was a pretty good rate of pay, right? Making $500 for an hour and a half when he'd already been charging a lot of money for people to attend this workshop. So at the end of the first day, as soon as he finished, Somebody said, oh, I'll take that one, Zoltan. And so it was sold. The next day, when he was about three quarters of the way finished the painting, somebody said, I'll take that one and put their hand up. So that by the fifth day, when he started the painting with the very first brush stroke, someone said, that painting's mine. And so what was going on here? Well, were these paintings desirable? And it's like, yes, they were very desirable. First of all, because Zoltan Zabel was a brilliant painter. But also, as many of you will know, when you attend a workshop uh, with an artist, you have a special affinity for the pieces that you see them create while you're there. So the fact that they were actually there watching Zoltan create that painting made it even more desirable. And was there scarcity? Well, yes, there was, because he was only going to be creating five paintings uh, during that week. So there was only five available. And... 
I mean, as morbid as this sounds, this was towards the end of Zoltan's life. He'd already had a stroke. People realized there's not going to be that many more years of Zoltan creating paintings. This might be the last chance that we actually get to attend a workshop with him and actually buy one of his pieces that he created there. So that starts to create the urgency. But then the urgency also was caused by the fact that paintings were selling quicker and quicker each day. So that on that last day, I'm sure there were a number of people who were waiting to see what he was going to paint that were hoping to buy it. But that one person, as soon as he touched the breast of the paper, said, this one's mine because we had desirability, we had scarcity, and we had urgency. Now, I'm going to tell you a story a little bit later on how I use these three things to actually do an online sale of my work where we generated $40,000 in sales in one weekend using these concepts of scarcity, urgency, and desirability. But let me break this down a little more now by what exactly are these three things. So desirability is pretty self-evident. It's how much somebody actually likes your work and would like to take it home and hang it on their wall. The more they like the work, the more they are going to be willing to spend. Now let's talk about scarcity. This is something that's really, really important because if there's a lot of something available and a lot of people are offering it or a similar product, then the public is going to go to the one that's the best value. And that means the cheapest. So if your work is not scarce, you're never, ever going to get the higher prices. So you need to have the scarcity element in your work. And then we also add urgency. And urgency means the people fear of missing out, right? If they don't buy now, they may not be able to buy it or might not be available later. When you put all three of these things together, you will sell. Sell what doesn't matter what it is you're selling, but in particular with your art. But how do we go about increasing the desirability, increasing the scarcity, and increasing the urgency? Well, that's what I'm going to get into in just one sec. But right now, it's time for a word from our sponsor, and that's me. Tim Packer Art Academy. So here's a little video that shows you the success one of my students has had and also shows you how you can get the exact same training that she had. So I sold out the artist project, which was like a four day event. And it was just so overwhelmingly positive. I just couldn't believe it. And then I had a few shows since then. And I had people come driving from Toronto to purchase my work, which was crazy because they were just local shows. And I just sell it within like the first two hours of the show starting. And I just be like, how is this happening? Can you imagine going from hobby painter to successful artist in less than two years, selling out at multiple art festivals and learning how to do this from the comfort of your own home at your own pace and with a successful artist who's made millions from the sale of his own work me and all for less than the cost of one blank canvas well that's exactly what emily valentine has done emily was studying to become a veterinarian but what she really dreamed of was pursuing a career as an artist in the fall of 2020 she enrolled in my online art academy and now she's living her dream life going into her studio every day following her passion and barely keeping keeping up with the demand for her paintings. Now, how was she able to do that? By taking my online courses, by working very hard and following my teaching advice. Now, here's the best part. Anyone with a passion for art, a solid work ethic, and a willingness to learn can do it too. So if you are struggling to make a living from your art and you desperately want to change that, take that first step towards your dream life as an artist. I know it sounds crazy, but you too could experience the same kind of success is Emily. Look, becoming a successful artist is not about being magically anointed with some special gift. It's about learning the right skills and concepts and then putting them into practice. And I can help you do that. So if you dream of a life where you get to follow your passion and make a good living from doing that, click on the learn more button. Let's talk about increasing the desirability of your work. You first need to understand that it's not magic, luck, or some sort of gift that results in the public highly valuing a certain artist's work. And all of the things that are required to go into creating a highly desirable body of work are all learnable and they're all teachable. And that's what I cover in my program. So if you really, really want a successful career as an artist, it's not only possible, but highly probable, providing you're willing to do the work. 
you also have to understand something about the art world and that is there is no one unified art world the art world is more like a bunch of little art villages and they all have very different rules in terms of what makes a great painting now if you're in the business of selling your art which is the village where I live, which is in the village of commercial sales, you need to understand that it is totally different than the world uh, dominated by postmodernism. And then this is what is taught in a lot of universities and what is exhibited in a lot of publicly funded galleries and museums. And that's the, the work like the meat dress, like the three blank canvases or the show that was held in a gallery in Britain recently of invisible artworks. These were actually blank podiums and blank walls where celebrities and artists sent in a description of their invisible piece of work and people actually went in and looked at this and commented on it and it got all kinds of write-ups. That is the world of postmodernism. That has nothing to do with the world of commercial sales. And in commercial sales, artists get paid when people buy their work. They either are buying it directly from you or they're buying it through a gallery and the gallery is taking its commission and then paying you. Well, guess what? In the village of commercial sales, the public values all of the traditional skills and concepts that have been important in art since the Enlightenment. So things like drawing, things like composition, mastering light and shadow, technical expertise, understanding perspective, atmospheric perspective, all of the things that went into the great master's works, all of those things, the public values. And the more of those things are exhibited in your work, the more the public will value it. So if you want to increase the value of your paintings, you need to be willing to put in the work to master all of the traditional skills and all of the traditional concepts. And you need to create work that demonstrates this mastery. Now, if you can do that, the public will be willing to spend a lot more money on your work than they currently are now. Now, you also will have increased the scarcity of your work or similar quality work. Look, most artists that are out there have gone through the colleges and universities with the absolute BS of postmodernism. They lack the skills. They lack the concepts. They're basically just pushing paint around, hoping for genius to occur. If you've mastered all the skills, you will be able to create work that stands head and shoulders above the rest of these artists who have not taken the time to master the skills. So there will be less of work at your level. So that will increase the scarcity. But you're still going to be competing with other artists out there who have mastered all of the skills. And whenever you're competing with other artists uh, that are producing similar quality work, the public is always going to go to the one that's the best value, which is the cheapest, which means if you just want to compete in that realm, the only way to gain a competitive advantage over the other artists at the similar skill level is to lower your prices. And then you end up in a race to the bottom, and that's not a race you want to be in, never mind win. So then we come to how do you develop the ultimate scarcity of, of your work, and that is to create your own unique voice, to be able to create work in a way that as soon as someone looks at it, they know who did it. The only question then becomes, can they afford it? So if you can create your own unique voice, and you are creating work that demonstrates mastery of skill, mastery of techniques, mastery of concepts, and is highly desirable, that is how you get to the point where people are spending thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on your work. But make no mistake, you can't get here without mastering the skills and concepts. And the work has to actually exhibit this mastery and demand this mastery for it to be done. Because if it doesn't require mastery of skills and concepts, guess what? You'll be easily copied. And if anyone can do similar work, then guess what? Someone will be willing to do it for less money. And then again, you get into that race for the bottom. So it's not enough just to have incredibly desirable work if it doesn't require the skill and mastery. I mean, you can create some pretty spectacular things. And I've seen it on YouTube where people put a canvas, uh, hang a canvas, spin it, and then just pour paint on it. It can be actually breathtaking. But here's the thing. I can learn how to do that in a weekend. And so can anyone else out there. And they will just undercut your prices. So the work has to require mastery and all of the things I've talked about. And there's no way to get there without putting the time in. But the good news is once you do that, your competition just falls by the wayside. Because most of the people out there today trying to make a living from their art 
have not even come close to mastering the skills and techniques, never mind the concepts. And then they also have not created a unique voice. So once you can do this, once you can create great work with a unique voice, and by great work, I mean work where when the public sees it, a significant amount of them go, oh my God, I love it. I have to have it. And they get out their wallets. So once you can create work that does that, with a unique voice, making a living as an artist is actually quite easy. Until or unless you can do that, it is almost impossible. So wouldn't it make sense right now to just decide that if that's what you really want, you're going to put your head down, you're going to do the work, and you're going to get to the point where you've mastered all the skills and concepts. You're going to spend time in process mode, pushing your creativity, uh, trying to find that unique voice. And just knowing that once you get there, then making a very good living as an artist is, like I say, not only possible, it's highly probable. Okay, let me tell you about an online sale that I had where we were able to generate $40,000 in sales in the course of one weekend. So this was back in 2020, right during COVID, and I made the decision I was going to close down my gallery. Up until this point, I had my own bricks and mortar gallery that I'd been running for about five years that was very successful. Um, but during COVID, we decided it was time to close it down. But that left me with a problem is I had all this inventory. I had a ton of stretched uh, G-clay prints that were hanging in the gallery, as well as a number of originals. And the biggest problem that I had with this was once we gave up the gallery, I had my basement full of all this inventory and I just wanted to get rid of it. Now I thought about maybe renting a storage unit, but I didn't want to do that. So I thought, you know what, let's just do an online sale, but we're only going to sell the inventory that we have. We're not going to be doing a sale of prints that, that where we would then print on demand and, and fill the orders. I just wanted to get rid of the stuff that I had. Now, up until now, I'd been doing once a year a uh, sale every year online where I offered like a 20% discount on all of my prints. And we would usually do seven to $10,000 in sales in a weekend. And that was actually quite good. I was happy with that. But I didn't want to do that this time because I didn't want to sell work that we didn't have in stock that we then have to print and stretch and ship and have the pieces in stock still in my basement. So we decided we were going to have a sale, but it was only going to be of the pieces that I have in stock. Now to do that, we also had to set up our gallery so that there was only one of each available. So as soon as a piece sold, it, it was marked as sold. And I also included a few originals that I had at this time as well. And this was only going to be available to people who subscribe to my newsletter. So I made the announcement out to my newsletter subscribers that we're going to be having this sale and that it was starting at, I believe it was 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And so my son, Cameron, who works with me, set up the gallery uh, online and it was a hidden gallery that you needed a link to get to. So at eight o'clock, the email went out with the link to the hidden gallery. Now I slept in that morning. I didn't get up till about 9.30. And when I got up, we already were at like 10,000 in sales. Uh, by 11 o'clock in the morning, we were at 20,000 in sales. And by the next day, by the time the sale was over, we did over 40,000 in sales. And that was by far the biggest online sale I'd ever had. Well, why did it happen? Like, it, it sounds crazy because before I had everything I had available was on sale and multiple copies of it, which meant someone could come on, 10 people could buy the same print if they wanted to on sale and my previous sales. But in this one, because there was only one of each, here's what started happening. And I heard from people afterwards, this was what was happening. There was a number of people on first thing in the morning and they would put several items in their cart that they planned on on buying um, and were kind of looking around. Then they'd go to check out and find out that that item that they'd put in their cart was no longer available because it wasn't enough just to put something into your cart. It, until the piece was sold, anyone could buy it. So people started seeing pieces disappearing before their eyes being marked sold. And all of a sudden there was some urgency. It was like, wow, I better get on and buy now or else I might not be able to buy at all. And for five or six pieces they were thinking of, but they were trying to make up their mind, but they realized I don't have forever to do this. I need to make a decision now or I might get none of them. And that's what happened. Now, I wondered if this was a fluke or if we could do this again. So the next year, I had another online sale where we did exactly the same thing. Even though we didn't have inventory, I said, we're just going to allow one of everything. 
for sale. All of my prints, just one of each. And I also had some originals there as well. And we did the same process up to it. And guess what? We did 40,000 in sales again. Now you can actually see this sale live. I actually was hoping we were going to have the similar results. So I actually started filming as the sale went live and over the course of the weekend. So you can hear me talking about how I set up this online sale and also see as the sales are coming in during the course of me filming that video. So I'll put a, a link to that at the, at the end of this video. I would also see the same thing happen at shows that I had at galleries. Usually it would go like this. People, if it was a well-attended opening, you know, people would be there milling around for an hour or so, having their glass of wine and looking, and then maybe one painting sold and then another painting sold. And then as soon as the red dots started going up, more and more and more red dots started going up this because people realized, oh my God, I need to make a decision. Like again, if they were trying to decide on one of maybe three or four pieces, as soon as they see one of those pieces sold and then maybe another one sold, they're like, holy geez, I better get in here and, and get this one before they're all gone. So I would often have that, that I'd have the same number of sales in the first night as I would have over the next two weeks because the people who really, really wanted pieces were there. And once pieces started selling, then that urgency went up. Now for your originals, the scarcity is automatically built in. You can only do so many paintings a year. And when I was actually more involved in painting and selling my work than in the teaching side of things, I was in about 13 galleries and I could never keep up with the demand for my work. So my work was always selling faster than I could replace it. And that just meant that it would keep selling faster because people knew that if it went to a gallery, once they got a shipment of my work in, that they were likely going to sell some. There was one gallery. I was in gallery on the lake. Um, she would then let clients know when I was bringing in a shipment of new work and they'd be there waiting and often pieces would sell before I even got them from my car to the inside of the gallery because people were watching me bring stuff in. So again, if you want to get high prices for your work, you need to have extremely high desirability. The only way to get that is to master all of the skills and the concepts because that is what the general public values. You also need scarcity. Now you can get that to a certain degree just by elevating your skills and your knowledge. Um, but the best way to do that is to actually develop your own unique voice so that you are the only one who is producing that type of work. And then with urgency, well, that comes automatically just by the limits of how much work you can produce, but we can do things to kind of manufacture that. And in my case, with the online sales of just having one of everything uh, for sale, people knew if they wanted to buy that piece, they better get in and buy it right now uh, because they couldn't get it that price after that. So I hope you found this helpful. And if you're still watching, I'm assuming that what I'm saying is resonating with you and you really, really, really want to have the life of a successful artist where you get to go into your studio every day, do what you love, follow your passion and actually have the world reward you with a decent living. I can help you do that. And for just $199. Now I know it sounds too good to be true, but it's not. I first put these principles to test when I mentored Brooke Cormier back in 2017. She went on to earn over $30,000 in her first year with no previous formal art training. And you can actually see her journey and all of our meetings on this channel under the mentorship program. And then there's Emily Valentine, one of my students who completely sold out in her first three shows and ended up quadrupling her prices over the course of one summer. And now she's no longer doing art festivals because she can't keep up with the demand just from sales that are coming in from her social media. And then there's Emma Hainstock, another one of my students, did $7,000 in her first festival. And last year in her first summer of selling her work, she did over 24000 in sales doing just three shows. And finally, Monica Marquez Gattaca, who sent me a wonderful email in January. They just finished completing her taxes, and she just wanted to let me know that she had done over $40,000 in sales last year. Now, all of these artists are on their way to living their dream lives, and none of them thought it was possible before signing on with me 
None of them are gifted. None of them are special. I'm not gifted. I'm not special. They all took that first step, that leap of faith. They enrolled in my art academy, assumed that I knew what I was talking about and put those principles to work. And now all of their lives are changed. So if you dream of the same kind of success, what are you waiting for? Click on the link in the description. At least learn about what it is I'm offering in my Unstoppable Artist program. And remember, there's a 30-day, no questions asked, money-back guarantee. So you literally have nothing to lose and everything to gain, including the life you dream about. So click on the link and hopefully I'll see you in the Tim Packer Art Academy.